<laughs> okay, let's get back in. What? Beautiful, right? I was at the Kotel, though. Ah. That's Ghanaian. Yeah, Baruch Hashem, I was there. I just got back late last night. Oh, my God. I was... And the flight was packed. Ribbana Shurallam. Every type of Jew was sitting on me. I couldn't get through. Oh, my God. Everything. The whole thing. Okay, Baruch Hashem. Okay, guys, let's go. Page 36. Let's go back. Or maybe go forward. Depends how you look at it. Let's do Yom Kippur and the Halakhot and the ideas. We have a lot to discuss. Right. Well, we're going to have Yom Kippur next year unless Mashiach comes. Well, that's a good question, actually. What happens to Yom Kippur if and when Mashiach comes? It's a good question. You had a question? No. Okay, here we go. Yom Kippur. No, no I'm not moving the midterm. Midterm is next Thursday. Yeah, you, you can take a vote. I'm not going to listen to it. You can take it. Do whatever you want. You can break dance if you want. L, yeah. Okay. So let's. Do, yeah, yeah. We're going to do that. Beautiful. Great question. Great question. Okay, guys, shh, shh. let's get together. Let's use a little bit of study over here. That's why your parents are paying for you to be here. So let's do that. Yom Kippur. The Gemara tells us, we'll start with exactly what you said, exactly, El. Gemara says, two happiest days in the calendar. The two happiest days of the calendar are one, Yom Kippur, and two is the 15th day of the month of, of two Ba'av. Tu ba'av, right? Two like that. Two is not a word, right? It's a number. Fifteenth of av. Shh, shh, shh. What is it about those two days? How are they connected? So the answer is, I'm not too sure. But I do know why Yom Kippur is a happy day, because the rabbis speak about it. Yom Kippur is a day that all of our sins are wiped away. We're going to see how that happens, what sins particularly, what we have to do in order to create that. So that's going to be today's class. <clears throat> so let's focus. Yom Kippur is happy. El, you like, but we're talking about life and death. But if you're wiping away all your sins and you're getting a chance to come to close to Hashem, that's, by the way, why Shabbat never accepts a fast day. Shabbat never, any fast day that falls on Shabbat, it's nidche, means it's pushed off. It's pushed off. The only exception is Yom Kippur. And the reason is because Shabbat is called Shabbat Shabbaton, and so is Yom Kippur, the Sabbath of Sabbaths. Other holidays are called Shabbat or Shabbaton. Yom Kippur and Shabbat are called Shabbat Shabbaton because both of them have the same root, which is to return. Yom Kippur, you return to Hashem okay, by getting rid of your sins. And on Shabbat, once a week, you return as well. So the two work together very, very nicely. And that's why you don't, you're not allowed to be upset on Shabbat. But Yom Kippur, you're not really upset because your sins are being wiped away. You're working hard at it. It's like uh, running a marathon, right? It's painful, it's challenging, but the accomplishment at the end is worth the effort. So we have to define what happiness is. Happiness is not, I'm walking around happy, woohoo, right? That's not it. That's why there is no halal on Yom Kippur, okay? It would be chutzpah right? To sing songs on halal, like, hey, I'm sorry. That's not what it is. That's a Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. There's no halal because we're being judged. But we are optimistic that our Sins will be wiped away through Teshuvah, which we're going to talk about today as well. We're also going to talk about shoes today. That's going to have a major part of the Yom Kippur process. We're going to talk about shoes. So all of this means that Yom Kippur accepts Shabbat like this year. Shabbat and Yom Kippur came together, which by the way is a very good thing. A very good thing. Because many people don't, many people don't keep Shabbat, unfortunately. Okay? But this year, they keep Yom, many people keep Yom Kippur. So ergo, they did keep Shabbat without even realizing it, or not intentionally, and it's still, uh, it's still worth it. By the way, there is an opinion in the Gemara, if you keep two Shabbats, Mashiach comes. There's a Gemara, it says if the Jewish people keep two Shabbats, Mashiach comes. So one opinion is literally two consecutive Shabbats. Some say no, it's actually referring to Shabbat Yom Kippur when they come together, because there's a double impact, and that's actually two Shabbats. Yom Kippur is called Shabbat, and Shabbat is called Shabbat. So maybe that's what the Gemara is talking about. So they say this year is a very good sign, Bezrat Hashem, for Mashiach's arrival. Okay? So that's what makes it happy. El, that's what makes it happy. I'm wiping away my sins. It's painful. It's difficult. Again, like working out. Painful, difficult, but the consequences are good. So we are happy at the consequences, but we don't walk around like dancing and singing with halal saying we're very happy. 
Moore and then Sarah, yeah. Uh, what if someone makes use of the beauty of this word? Okay, let me be very clear on that very important question. Do not get upset with anybody else on Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur. Let it go. If they want to pick two days not to be upset, I would choose Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur because your entire year is based upon how you are in your own Rosh Hashanah and actually all 10 days, but specifically Rosh Hashanah, which is part of the Aseret Meit Teshuvah, 10 days of repentance, and Yom Kippur, which is the last day. So you really do not want to lose your temper or get upset. There are many stories of many great people, not so great people, who have learned to control their emotions on those days specifically. Because Rosh Hashanah, as we said, is a microcosm of the entire year. Yom Kippur is kefer keflayim. How much more so? Kal v'chomer, as we say. So controlling emotions. You are able to control your emotions. Of course, but like we're humans. We are humans, and it's understandable. But on this day, we have become superhuman. Actually, we become like angels. We'll see most of what we do on this day makes us like angels don't eat, they don't drink, they don't wear shoes, they don't walk around. You know, we become angels on this day which we'll talk about when we talk about Baruch Shem Kavol Machatol Anved, that we say loudly is because the angels save that verse. So we become like angels. We're going to get there as well. Sarah Anstein, how can I help? Um, the Shabbat has a literal translation. It does. It means to rest, but within the word, there's always extra meanings within words. So the word literally means to rest. And you're doing the Yom Kippur, you're not doing any malacha. Right? Yom Kippur and Shabbat actually are also the only days, write this down, where you do no malacha. On the holidays, including Rosh Hashanah, you do ochel nefesh. You can prepare and cook food. Okay, ochel nefesh. You write that down. Which Shabbat and Yom Kippur is the only... Only days where there is no ochel nefesh. You do not do 39 malachot. On the other days, you can do certain malachot that are involved in preparing <coughs> food for consumption. What's malachot? Malachot, good word. Thanks for asking. Malacha, malacha in the plural... No, no. On, on Shabbat, you cannot prepare food. You cannot do the 39 malachah. You cannot cook or prepare food. Right? Like Yom Kippur. Malacha in the singular, in the plural, is malachot. It means that it refers to, and you'll do this next semester with me, Bizrat Hashem is the 39 labors, actions that are forbidden on Shabbat. There are 39 actions which are called the malachot that you cannot do on Shabbat. A bunch of them, about 10 of them, are food preparation related from sewing and harvesting and preparing and separating and crashing and cooking. Those you are allowed to do on the Jewish holidays for consumption that day. You can cook. What you cannot do is light a fire on Yom Tov. You can use an existing fire because the malacha of fire appears elsewhere in the 39 malachot, but not in the ones that are connected to food uh, cooking. Okay? So Yom Kippur and Shabbat have that in common as well. You cannot do any of the 39 malachot. It's the same stringency. Even when Yom Kippur does not fall on Shabbat, you cannot do 39 malachot. You can cook on Sukkot, and you can cook on Sukkot Torah, and Shemini Atzeret, and you can cook on Pesach, but you cannot cook on Yom Kippur. So Yom Kippur is very, very strict in that sense. Sarah, did I answer your question? Yes. What was your question again? Um, does Shabbat have a literal... Yeah, so there's another translation, like I asked you. It means shuv, to return. Shuv. Has inside, that's not the literal translation, but it's inside. Shuv means to return. So on Shabbat you return to Hashem, and Yom Kippur you do to Shuva. So it's related through that word. Okay, so to Shuva right, has Shuv in it, and that's what Shabbat has it as well. Right, Shuv to return. Okay? So there is a little bit of Yom Kippur inside Shabbat, a little bit of Shabbat inside Yom Kippur. The two work together very nicely. The other Fast days do not work together with the Shabbat in any way because they are there to upset us. Tisha B'Av, okay, it upsets us. We don't want that to fall on Shabbat, yeah. Ochel Nefesh are words from the Torah, thank you for asking, which means on the Jewish holidays you're allowed to eat food you prepared on the day itself. Life-saving food. Soul food, actually, is the literal translation of it, actually. Ochel Nefesh are words from the Torah, which say you cannot do malacha on the yomim tovim, on the holidays, but you can do cooking for food. Cooking of food you can do on the Jewish holidays. You learn that out from those two words that the Gemara tells us that describe food preparation on chagim. Do you understand? Yeah, but it's not related to 
It's not. Well, it's not rated because Yom Kippur, you cannot do Ochel Nefesh. You cannot do Ochel Nefesh. You cannot do that on Shabbat either. Yeah, precisely. All right, I'm showing you the, what's called the Miut. We're excluding that from this preparation. Yeah. Good. Anyone else? Fabulous. So let's go through. So the Mishnah tells us there are five things we do not do on Yom Kippur. These five things actually on a deeper level do relate to the five levels of the soul. And you can actually try to figure that out yourself in your own time. What is that? So Yom Kippurim says the Mishnah, Asur ba'achila, uvishtia, there is no eating, there is no drinking, urechiza, and there is no washing, uvishtia, uvishtia, sandal, and um, anointing yourself with creams, and there is no um, wearing leather shoes, okay? Over tashish mita, and no physical um, relations with one's spouse. All of these five things, pleasures, are removed on Yom Kippur. That's yeah. Five, uh, eating and drinking are together. Okay? So those are your five. Now, people think that this is the mitzvah of the day, but it's not. It's not. It's there to help you. The mitzvah of the day is Teshuvah. And this is the important thing. Now, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, who was the great uh, leader of the Jewish people at the times of the Mishnah, he actually put together the Mishnah and edited it. He didn't write it all, but he definitely put it together. He actually brings down an opinion that says you, you get Teshuvah on Yom Kippur even if you don't fast. Which sounds weird, right? But that's the whole point. So he's like, just living through the time actually has a kapara. But since you're doing it, you fast and you pray your entire day and all the rest of it. You want to maximize the um, ability. But just live, my point is just living the day itself. Yom HaKippur. The day is Machaper. You see, it's in the title. Yom Kippur. The day itself, just living through that time. People always tell me there are people who died of Yom Kippur or Motzi Yom Kippur. We should live to 120. But I would say probably your best bet, <laughs> if you want to pick a day to you know, move on to the next world, would be Motzi Yom Kippur. Because, right? by the way, actually, as a side point, there is a mitzvah. When is the mitzvah of Teshuvah, anyway? When do we do Teshuvah? When do we repent? So anytime. Actually, the mitzvah of Teshuvah is the day before you die. That's actually when the mitzvah is. But people don't know where they're going to die. So we do it all the time. But actually, the day before you die is really when the mitzvah kicks in. However, there's one day that God puts into the calendar from the creation of mankind, from creation of mankind called Yom Kippur, that uh, no, when a person gets married, their sins are wiped away to some degree. That's why you wear white. Your marriage day. Oh, that's the connection. But 15th of Av was marriage. That's what people, and you fast. Right? People have the custom to fast, yeah. That's a custom. But 15th of Vav, what happened on 15th of Vav? Made Shidduchim, right? So it's Shidduchim over here and Shidduchim over here. We have been with Shadduch with Hashem and Yom Kippur. And they used to make, there was a, um, we had a, there was a challenge. One of the tribes lost many members. Um, so they had to, they did a certain act and they, was a, they were forbidden to marry. And so they actually started Shidduchim to get this tribe back into the Jewish people. Yeah. Which tribe? Uh, Binyamin had a certain problem, a certain challenge with it, and they, they were kind of like relocated onto the state. It's a very unusual story, which I'm going to go into now. Yeah. I'm not saying a person should die young. I'm just saying that <laughs> if you're going to choose, I would, I would suspect. I mean, people say to me, do I know for sure? A person could do teshuva anytime, and it may work. But there's one day that will set aside where it's easier to do teshuva. It's much, much easier. Right? And just living through the day itself kind of wipes away a person's sins. Just like existing. Sounds crazy, right? But that's the way it is. So just living through the day? Yeah, the that's what he says. So he says, but since you're doing it, you might as well fast and pray. But just existing during the day itself has some, uh, has some impact on a person. Okay? I want to just talk about one of the things over here. So we kind of get the idea of eating and not drinking, yeah? It kind of humbles you. It's an affliction. It puts you into a state of mind. It reduces your yetzahara, right? Because you are, you know, you're feeling anguish. You're feeling anguish. You're feeling difficult. Yep, so that's, um, that's part of it. I want to just to, if you don't mind, just go back to uh, page uh, 31 for just one second. Because some of you missed that anyway. Okay? So, 
It says, Ach basal achor shivi azei kipurim hu mikdash kosh yelachem ve'initem. That, that word, just take that word out and write it down. In Nitem, it's the Pasuk from Vayikra 2327. Yep, it says, You should afflict. Those, that list of five things are called the Inuim. They are called the afflictions. If someone says to you, what are the Inuim? It's referring to this. These five things that we afflict our bodies with on Yom Kippur to get into the zone of Teshuvah. Can everyone see the word? Yeah. You should, why is it called nefesh? Because the nefesh is the physical aspect of a person's soul. So you're afflicting your physicality with these five things. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You're afflicting yourself by taking on these five things, these five afflictions. They are no eating, no drinking. No eating, no drinking. No. Um, washing, no anointing yourself with creams, and not having leather shoes or sexual relations. You are withdrawing from the physical. Got them? And they are called the five inuyim, and they do relate somehow to the five levels of the soul. Actually, the eating and drinking we hear, and the washing we kind of hear as well, because it's unpleasant not to be able to, you know, put water in yourself. But what about the shoes? Did we discuss the shoes yet in this class? Okay, let's do that for a few minutes. I want to talk about shoes a little bit and the deepest significance of why shoes. We're not told to, I don't know, stick a fork in your leg, right? All right, you're told to like not wear leather shoes. So I want to talk for just a minute about what shoes represent in Judaism and the, and the connection to Yom Kippur. I actually discussed this in my, did anybody here do my Mashiach class yet? Okay, you will be Zerat Hashem. So when we talk about reincarnation, we talk about shoes. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Okay, we'll see why the two classes in reincarnation end up talking about shoes. It just makes sense. Yes, Sarah? Can I take a guess at why we wear shoes? Please. <laughs> Maybe this is incorrect, but I thought about this. Good. When we're all buried, we're all buried in the same coffin because we're all equals. Okay. So wearing leather, I, I believe in the past was more of like a maybe a rich person thing to do. Okay. When we're all wearing non-leather shoes, it makes us equal. And we're it's funny, you're actually answering a different question without realizing it. You're, you're, what you're saying is true. There was actually a takana. People used to basically bury rich people in rich clothing and then poor people in poor clothing. And Rabbi Gamliel, I think in the Gavara, changed that. I think it was him and said, everyone has to be buried in tachrichin, the same shrouds, with no pockets, by the way because you don't take it with you. That was the idea. And the idea of there was to show a quality that maybe during a person's life, there are hierarchies of different people, but when it comes to leaving this world, um, we don't wear shoes. That is true. A person's not bare with their shoes on. Actually, by the way, something else over here. Socks is considered to be barefoot. Anything that's not leather shoes is considered to be barefoot. I want to mention, though, that there is a custom which I've never seen written inside, but I've heard. Not, you can take a dead person's clothing, but you should not wear a dead person's shoes. Oh, I heard about this. That's a real thing. That's, I've never seen it written inside, but I heard it from, from somebody. You, so, you know, you, people are laying, if a person dies, they donate clothing. But I think you should not do the shoes. Sarah, I think it's connected to what you're saying a little bit, but it's also connected to this. So let, let's have a look at what shoes represent in Judaism. And it's actually very, very interesting. Um, well, it's my daughters because they order enough shoes off Amazon to, uh, you know, Amazon. last uh, 500 lifetimes, Baruch Hashem. Okay, so what do shoes represent? So what is a shoe in Hebrew, first of all? A na'al, right? In the singular, it's a na'al. In the plural, it's na'alayim. So what do shoes represent? So the Gemara makes a very, very, sta very famous statement, which you're going to write down. And I'll do it in the English because the Hebrew is not going to help you too much. Just like... And everything we're going to see kind of revolves around this statement. The shoe <coughs> holds the body, right? Your shoe or the kalim, the vessel that holds the body. So too, and I want to guess the end. And I want to guess the end of this very famous chazal. The body holds the more? The shoe. No. The soul. the soul. So too, the body, if you will, is the shoe that holds the neshama, the soul. 
Okay. A very cryptic yet fascinating statement. Just like the shoe holds the body, the shoe holds the body. Interestingly, it holds the bottom, yeah? The bottom of the foot. Oh, no, the foot goes in. So to the body holds the various levels of the neshamot inside it. Just like a shoe, by the way, yeah, holds the bottom part. So to the body holds the bottom level of the soul, and the other parts of the soul kind of extend out of it. So if it's like flip-flops, it's not very practical. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you can wear flip-flops on Yom Kippur. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about shoes, though. Actual <laughs> shoes. Traditional shoes that hold and give support to the entire foot. And notice the shoe is the lowest part on the lowest part of the body and comes into contact with the ground. Okay? It's interesting too. So let's just for just two minutes, just bear with me and answer me actually. Don't just look at me. Where else do we see Jew, uh, Jews, shoes in Jewish life? Where do we see shoes in Jewish life or Jewish history? Yes. Um, whenever the Kohanim Good. So when the Kohanim did that Avodah, what did they used to do? They would take shoes off. That's interesting. When they were up on Harabai, by the way, they got very sick from doing that because they were barefoot. It's freezing cold sometimes, or boiling hot. They're eating meat and bread the entire year, right? They had a full-time doctor up there. Being a Kohen wasn't so. Nowadays, it just gets an aliyah, you know? But back then, it was, it was a big avodah, a literal an avodah, a lot of work. So they used to go barefoot. Where else do we see shoes? Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu is told to what? Write that down. He's told to Sha'al Na'alecha Miraglecha. Told to take the shoes off of his feet. Told to take the shoes off of his feet. When? When was that? At the sne, at the burning bush. Right? The angel, Hashem, speaks him through the bush. By the way, why was that a burning bush? Right? It represents the Jewish people because we were alive, but it wasn't being consumed. So too, it was being shown. The Jewish people are like this bush. They're on fire in Egypt. You get to go in. This is when he got his mission to be the Mashiach of his day, to redeem and take the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim, Egypt. During that process, he was told to take the shoes off of his feet. Here's a great question with it, which I would not have known the answer at your age either. But if you know the answer, I'd be very impressed. There was somebody else in Jewish history, I'll give you a clue, not long after this event, that was told to take off his shoe for a similar visitation. Avraham. No, after this event. Avraham came before. He was a Navi. I think someone just said it. What did you say? Yeshua. That's correct. Yeshua bin Nun. Who was Yoshua? Moshe Rabbeinu's successor. He's about to enter into Jericho, Jericho. Write this down. It's a very important story. He's about to enter into Jericho. And it's nighttime. And an angel comes to visit him and says to him, you're going to die. He goes, why? He goes, because you're doing the wrong thing. You're preparing for battle because you're about to go into Jericho. And this is not going to be a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. You should be learning Torah. And he told him off. During that conversation, so that conversation is a very interesting conversation, how he ended up not killing him, and he became one of the greatest Jewish leaders in Jewish history. We learned the importance of Torah study when it comes to fighting battles, preparing ourselves spiritually, not just physically, but we'll leave that aside. But I will say that the angel said the same words to him, but changed and removed one letter. He says, Yoshua, Sha'al na'alecha miraglecha, take the shoes off your feet. But he removes one letter, and that's the letter Yud. Why has he missed that letter? Why is that letter taken out of Nalech, your shoes? Because he took off one shoe. He was told to remove one shoe. That's weird. Why would Yoshua, and this is written in Tanakh, be told to take off one shoe? When his great rabbi master, Moshe Rabbeinu, when he was visited by an angel to be given his mission, took off both shoes. Okay. I'm not going to answer that right now. I'm going to keep going with a couple more examples, and then we're going to come back, and this, you'll know the answer to this question yourselves. Okay? One, two, two shoe. Three shoe. You can fill the fish. Okay. Moshe Rabbeinu Shalom Lecha Raglecha. Yoshua Shalom Lecha Meraglecha. Anywhere else in Jewish life, I'll give you a clue. Lo Aleinu. Where remove shoes? At a... 
at Sheva, yeah. When a person dies, the Sheva Krovim, the seven close relatives mourn and they do Shiva. Yeah, Shiva. Who are the seven close relatives? Mother, father, brother, sister, son, daughter, and spouse. That's seven. Those are called the Sheva Krovim, the seven close relatives. And a person sits Shiva and they walk around during the Shiva, during the seven days, seven days of mourning with no shoes. It just can't be discomfort. It's got to be something else. Because there's too many other cases of people who are taking off shoes that may be uncomfortable, but there's got to be a deeper reason. Any more examples? There's one more example that I can think, I'm sure there's many more examples, where someone takes off a shoe. Well, that's because you have to, you can't have any, any clothing on, but specifically shoes. Person takes off their shoe and they spit in it. Yibu. Oh, Yibu. Yeah. Halitza. They take off their shoe. I'm in a, I'm in a what's it called, Begela class right now. We just, we're learning roots. You're learning roots. Very good. That was a case of Yibum, not Chalitza. Although Ploni Almoni that's did do Chalitza. That's because we talked about Very that. Very good. Ploni Almoni. Yeah. Becca, what do you want to say? I thought it was like the, the three Mark and the King of Abraham. Uh, oh, very, very good. So there, <laughs> that's very interesting. He told him to wash his feet oh. because they used to worship the dust on their feet. So when, when Avram speaks to the three Malachim, he didn't want them to bring the dust inside the house because there was some Avodah Zorah connection. So that's a little bit different. It's interesting. That was more about washing their feet in order to prepare them to come to his house. Okay, fine. So the answer is Yibum. Yibum. So what is Yibum? Does anyone know what this is? This is actually a mitzvah of the Torah. It's called Yibum. One of the six related mitzvot. And this mitzvah, as you have, I'm actually learning this Gemara with my son because weirdly enough, I don't know why, they're learning this Gemara, this tractate in... Uh, in ninth grade, my kids yeshiva. It's not really. It's not. It's a very unusual tractate for kids to learn. I'm not sure why they're doing it. So what is yibum? So yibum is you have two brothers. One gets married, and the other one does not. And the one who is married does not have kids, and he dies. He now has. He's now zikuk. He has to um, marry his deceased brother's wife. Okay. We do not do Yibum nowadays. It's only a mitzvah that applies when the Beit HaMikdash stands. We don't have, we're not at the level, said the rabbis, to experience this mitzvah now. However, however, we do do Chalitza and don't do it now, but there, I actually looked it up recently, so I want to show my son. There are videos online of the Chalitza ceremony. What's Chalitza? Chalitza is how you get out of Yibum. So nowadays you cannot do Yibum, but you do Chalitza. The word Chalitza means to take off, to remove. Chalitza. You take off the shoe. You take off the shoe. So you cannot, ma- nowadays, it is forbidden to marry your deceased brother's wife. Why? And by the way, what's the reason for doing it? So they have a child, and it says the child's name is going to continue. The, the dead brother's name is going to continue. Shem Achiv. The, the dead brother's name is going to continue. By the way, I don't know any examples where they actually name this child from the name of his deceased father. It actually means the neshama is going to now come out, that's what the Ramban says, through this, this, uh, this living brother. And they get the field. Well, property. depends whatever the property is, if they have, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just not clear on whose shoe you're taking and who is Great. It. So, very, very good. So, the, it's going to sound unusual. There's a special shoe that is used for the ceremony with straps on it, and it's actually put on the man. I always thought it was the woman. It's put on the man, the brother, the living brother. He takes it off, and he spits in it, or maybe she spits in it, actually. No, she does. He takes it off, and she spits in it. And by the way, there's, there's halachot around this. If you watch the video, takes the shoe off of her brother-in-law. There's a case of a very old couple. A woman got married. She never had kids. Her husband died, and the brother was still alive, and he had to do chalitza. What if there's no brother? Hmm? What if there's, no then there's no mitzvah. And so they do it, and, they, and, and she spits in the shoe, and it can't, it can't, sorry to say this, there's no projectiles, but it's got to be like, like let it drop inside. There's many halachot that I'm not familiar with, but I saw by watching this video, it's a very unusual ceremony. But it's unusual, they took the shoe off. So the shoe off is here as well. Okay, fine. What have all these things got to connect them? 
And what have they got to do with Yom Kippur? That's what we're getting. That's our topic, right? I mean, it's an interesting aside, but it's all got to connect to Yom Kippur. Okay, so we'll see why, well, the, why this mitzvah exists, we're not too sure. We know the Kabbalists tell us that you're actually bringing this dead, per, this dead brother's soul back into this world, into the child. Very, very good. So that's, that's my question. Why are we doing this? It's one of the 613 mitzvahs. So why is it? What is it about? What statement is being made by doing this? So you have to answer what you're So once again, if shoes, but why is that part of the ceremony, Maya? Shoe? You're not allowed to. Yeah. Oh, why is the shoe itself? Yeah, that's what we're discussing. What a shoe. This is a shoe class. Maybe, well, what else would you say? I don't know, his face. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, by the way, when you spit on something, it's respectful. It, yeah. You're basically saying if there's a, an element of disgust, it's not lazy. right? Element of disgust that goes with it. By the way, <laughs> as a side point, you know, maybe your grandmothers went, when they heard news, like negative, like, pee, 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 or poo, poo, poo. You ever see that? It's actually a spit. I mean, it's spitting. You're saying that this idea, it should be, you know, negative. I spit at it. I'm, I'm removing it. That's where it comes from. That's why another thing, actually, you're saying PPP. Palti Yosef, Palti Yosef, Palti Yosef, because Paltiel and Yosef both were against the Ayn Hara. So maybe that's the reason. Maybe it's PPP. But it's also there's like a, there's an, an element of spitting because you're, you're dismissing that thing by spitting on it. It's dismissive. It's not nice. Okay. So what's the connection over here? Okay, so it goes like this. This is important. If shoes represent the body, yeah, and the body represents the... So there's an element of, I'm removing my body. What are you left with out of the body? And the Shama. So let's go through this. The Kohenim are the spiritual people, right? They're a Goy Kadosh. They're working with the, in the um, Mishkan of Beit HaMikdash. So they're taking the shoes off so that they are now more spiritual. Because the physical aspect, the body, is being removed. Moshe Rabbeinu gets his mission to save the Jewish people. Right? He's given nuvua at this point. So Hashem is saying, take your shoes off, because now you are divesting your physicality to become more spiritual. Your shoe is great, but not as great as Moshe Rabbeinu. It's only one shoe. He was never as great. Moshe Rabbeinu is the greatest prophet that ever lived. Yoshua was lower than him. So his level of Nuvua, prophecy, greatness was only half or less than Moshe Rabbeinu, or whatever it was. So he only took one shoe off. It was like a message. You know what I'm saying? You're great, but you're not that great. You're not as great as Moshe Rabbeinu. When a person mourns, they've lost the person, right? Their body's gone, so it represents the shoe. Yeah? And the Yibum, they've not allowed, since, they, since they're not doing Yibum, they've not allowed this Neshama to come back. They're, so they remove the shoe to say that I'm not allowing this Neshama to come back because I'm doing Chalitza. On Yom Kippur, when we take our shoes off, it's not just the discomfort, it's also I'm removing my physicality to become more spiritual. So That's why the shoe is being removed Yom Kippur. I am, there's a high level of spirituality I'm connecting to by doing this. Make sense? It's not just the discomfort. Or you can do many things to make yourself discomfort. And you're doing it for other things. Specifically shoes. Now we know that angels, malachim, are not physical. But they're described. And one way they're described is that they don't speak and they don't move. Right? They're, they're one-legged. It doesn't mean literally one-legged. It means that they, they remain stationary when it comes to their growth. Yeah? They're angels. They don't grow spirit. They have no mitzvot. Right? They're spiritual robots. That's what an angel is. Right? They work for us. They get their job done. So angels don't wear shoes. On Yom Kippur, we become like Malachim. Malachim don't eat, we don't eat. Malachim don't drink, they don't shower. They, don't, they just are, they just exist, getting their mission done. So we become like angels. Where do we see in the Yom Kippur service that we have the status of angels? We also wear white. No, we don't whisper Shema. Very, very good. So during the year, you say Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, and then you whisper, Baruch Shem Kavar Baruch Oh, that's because in the, in the Beit HaMikdash, they would fall down on the floor at that point when they said Hashem's name. Hashem's name was actually said on Yom Kippur in the Mishkan and Beit HaMikdash. Okay? So we still do a little bit of that. But why? Why do we say the words Baruch Shem loudly? In the rest of the year, we say it quietly. Yom Kippur, we shout it out. Baruch Shem, Kavol, Why do we do that? So the answer is, where does that verse even come from? 
No. No, on, on Yaakov's bed. No. No. Yeah. That's when it was said, but it's not written. It's not written anywhere. So where do we get it from? Moshe Rabbeinu. Went up to Har Sinai, and he heard the Malachim saying this verse. Yeah, he stole it from the angels. Right. He stole it from the angels. That's right. So he goes up to, he goes up to Shemayim, right, to receive the Torah. Right. It was said before. It was said, you're absolutely right. Yaakov's uh, kid said Shema Yisrael, because Yisrael is Yaakov, and he responded, but it's not written in the Torah. We don't know that. And Moshe Rabbeinu is not aware of it, because it wasn't written in the Torah, it wasn't revealed to him. But he went to Shemayim, he heard the angel, he's like, oh, that's so nice, I want to use it, but it's stolen goods, and we're not angels. So he said, well, we're going to whisper it. So he said, Jewish people, I have to say Shema, just like Yaakov responded, Baruch Shem Ved, before he died, but whisper it, because it's not nice. It's not nice. So we whisper it. But in Yom Kippur, we become angels. angels. So we have the right in Yom Kippur because we don't eat or drink or wear the shoes. Or We're allowed to say it loudly. So it's said loudly on Yom Kippur. So that verse, Baruch Shem Kippur, is the quintessential definition of what Yom Kippur is around. I would write that one down. Wait, where? Oh, here. Yeah. So I'm just clarifying. Sure. Reason, Yeshua only took up one shoe yeah. to like, humble him and say, his level of nouveau of prophecy wasn't the humble him, it was just the reality. He wasn't the level of Moshe Rabbeinu. So it was a lesson for him and for us. Okay. Yeah. What does Baruch Shein um, whatever, the rest? Um, Baruch Shein Gavol, and Ve'ed. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. And that's like the main point. That of is a, a verse that we say after Shema because it was said by the sons, of ya- the sons of Yaakov, it was the response to the sons of Yaakov, Jacob. Right? They said to him, Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohim Adonai Echad, and he responded, Baruch Shem Kavom Aksalom Ved. But that's not written in the Torah. That verse is not written anywhere. Anywhere in Tanakh, it's not written. But it, 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 it was uh, included in our liturgy, in our, in our prayer service after Shema. Yeah? You get it? And that's why we whisper it all year, because it's stolen goods, but Yom Kippur... We become like angels, so we're allowed to say it loudly. Yeah. So, um, I just wanted to clarify, do we have to go, like, like, sit in the No, it was just know that Yibum is the mitzvah and Chalitza is the get out. That bit you have to know. So it's just like a spitting of shoe? That's the, to remove the shoe and the spitting aspect of it, yeah. Okay. It's Yibum and Chalitza. Those are the two important words you need to know. Yeah. Um, why do you say stolen goods during the years? Well, we're not the level of angels. So we're not to say angelic prayers like that during the year. So Moshe Rabbeinu said, you know, whisper it. This is an angelic prayer. It's a very, very high prayer. It's a very, very, very important word. He's like, we'd be hot to turn up and like, so the Gemara says you whisper it. Isn't it like rubbing it in more that you're still working? But not on Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur we get a freebie. Yeah. Is Kedusha and Kedusha and Yom Kippur Shoshua Yasser also from Malachim? That is about Malachim. Kedusha, um, uh, Kedusha is about, or some say no, it's about Jewish people. Right? Kadosh, 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 right? Those are words said about the Malachim or about the Jewish people. It wasn't written by them. Good? All right. So we become like angels, we did. We did the shoes, we did that. We did the fasting a little bit. The Inuyim, that's the word, Ve'initem So you see those words, you know what they mean? means the five things we don't do on uh, Yom Kippur. Okay? Okay, if you want to see on page 37, the Sefer Chinuch talks about this mitzvah, so it's a mitzvah in the Torah, to remove these distractions that kind of like get in the way, and that's why he says we're going to eat food or drink liquid, yep, because they awaken the materialistic side of a person. And we want to be spiritual on this day. Okay? So that's what we do, to be like angels. Okay? And that is the leather shoes. Okay. And if you want to see that piece on 38, is a little summary of the, uh, the shoe thing and what the shoe represents. Right? And uh, that's the main reason we take shoes off. And there's also a custom to wear white lavan. You wear the white objects or clothing on Yom Kippur. Okay, Lavan represents purity and cleanliness. Okay, and the angels always represented by Lavan, white. Actually, if you pass all the colors 
through a prism, they come out white on the other side. So all the colors that go through a prism, they come out white. Just like Dark Side of the Moon album by Pink Floyd, but you have no idea what I'm talking about. Okay, great. That was well worth it. Uh, Roger Waters is your yeah, machinery. Yeah. Yeah, he is. Uh, you're, you're not, not, <laughs> that's okay. okay. David Gilmour just saw this. He, like, he said like, that he wasn't into it and he felt bad. He's also one of the greatest guitarists that ever lived. Okay. He's good. Yeah, are we good? Can you move on? Okay, fine. Um, oh, one last thing. I mentioned it last class. Just make sure again. So we have Yom. What does the word Kippur actually mean? <laughs> it's worth knowing that. Lottery. Is it like Kippur? Kippur. Kippur. No, no. no. What does atonement mean? To cover what? To cover up or wipe away. How do you know that? Oh, very good. Today I said that? She actually learned something. Oh, great. Thank you, Mika. You're absolutely right. Very good, yeah. The word kapara means to, to wipe away or to cover up. Wait, to cover up. Is so the word kippur literally means atonement. To have things. But what does it literally mean? A day of atonement. But what is the word? I mean, what is the, we always try to figure out the word itself. So the word, the word comes, well, it's connected to the lid that covered the aron. It was called the kaporet. Remember the Aaron with the Ten Commandments inside? Had the angels on top? Yep. So, actually, those angels are there as a representation of those angels who said, by the way. That's why there's angels inside the Holy of Holies. It's a side point. But that, yeah. Yeah. There was one solid block of gold. They faced and they were actually turned away, depending how the Jewish people were doing. Anyway, so that kaporet, it, a, it means to cover over. To cover over, meaning doesn't exist anymore. I don't want to see it. I don't relate to it. It's gone. It has gone. That's the word Kippur. But literally means... Uh, by the way, is there another Jewish holiday that Purim. sounds something like Purim? Yeah. <laughs> by the Purim. way, we do Purim next semester. I think I'm doing my Festivals 2 class. Where's the Festivals 1? I don't know. This is Festivals 1. Okay, it's so Festivals 2. We're going to do Purim and we'll see the word Yom Kippur means a day like Purim, but not as great. Purim is considered great Yom Kippur, say the rabbis. That's good. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. You did that, right? We did Yom Kippur. A day like Purim, but not as great. And we'll see what it is about Purim. Really, Purim is the flip. That's why you don't eat Yom Kippur, but you eat a lot and drink a lot on Purim. The two come together. Usually, you have in one holiday, um, spirituality and physicality. Right? You eat and you drink and you celebrate. Right? And you uh, pray and learn Torah. And do, but you don't do that in Yom Kippur. So Yom Kippur has a sister holiday, and that's Purim. It's actually the other, it's the other side of the same coin. But we'll do that next semester. Yeah. Day of atonement, day of wiping away sins or hiding sins. But no one calls it that. They just call it a day of atonement. But that's actually what it really is. Okay. Good girl, you're absolutely right. It should be, yeah. I shall, I shall recommend that. I shall recommend that. Okay, we're going to start that right now. Is it at the same time? What? I don't know. Oh, no, we're doing it now. We're on page 39. Okay, let's talk about some of the prayers of the day itself, and then I'm going to teach you how to do Teshuvah itself. So the first prayer we do is Kol Nidre. What is that all about? Why is such an important prayer? Why would you begin the special, most holiest day of the entire year with this unusual... And by the way, is that a prayer? Is that a, a declaration? What is it exactly? You're getting rid of your battle. I think it's a song, isn't it? So it is sung in a very solemn tune, but it does not yet. Yeah, but it's not... Need, oh, there's a reason why to do it three times. So no, three times, do it louder, louder. It's, a, it's a chazaka. Things that are done three times is more powerful and, and has... And now we know one misses it. But it's not from the court. No. No, no it's not. No. So what is it exactly? It's a rabbinic prayer. <coughs> and inside it, the, the word, yeah, we just saw the pasuk. No, 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 I'm saying beside, but I'm saying like, because um, I know we learned this. I is Yom Kippur, 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 Kippur in the Torah? Yes. 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 Does it mention the five afflictions? Yes. No. It mentions afflictions. But it doesn't, them. It doesn't tell us what they are. Very good. But that, all of those little things that go into it is from in the Gemara's. So, the words of Kol Nidre have inside it words from the Torah of things that we should not do. 
and that is to make vows, nidarim. If they are made, I mean, nowadays, it's, but they, it was a big deal. Or making a shavua was a big, 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 big deal. You're basically swearing in God's name that you saw something or didn't see something. It's a very, very big deal. It comes down to even things that are of a lower level, such as, I promise I'll see you tomorrow at three. Right? We always say, I call that the Jewish get-out clause for many promises you make. But at a certain time, you may have made certain promises or made certain statements or promised certain things you didn't fulfill. So the, you begin Yom Kippur by trying to remove any declarations you may have knowingly or unknowingly said. Right? You want to clear your speech. Basically, was what, what happens with that. Okay? Basically, but it's all vows, all oaths, all promises, all things you said, because the Gemara says, or the Torah says, whatever you say you're going to do, you should do. And many times you don't. Maybe sometimes circumstances lead you not to be able to. So Kol Nidre wipes that away. Kol Nidre means Kol Nidarim, or Shvuot, or Konams, all the list of like uh, things that a person says is wiped away. I just, that's all you need to know. There are, oh, by the way, oh, important. It's talking about prayers. How many prayer services there are there on Yom Kippur? Five. Oh, Lord. Like five no, no, five prayer five services. Five, no. five prayer services. Good girl. There are five. Let's write them down because everyone seems to mess them up. So what are the five prayer services that we see on Yom Kippur? So the first one is Kol Nidre. Isn't that also a part of Mashiach? No. Then there is Mariv or Arvit. Right? Then there is, there is, you have Shacharit the next morning. You have Musaf. And then you have. Yeah. That's probably Kol Nidre, probably then isn't probably the first of them actually. Probably Marv is the first one because Kol Nidre hasn't got it. So Kol Nidre actually goes together with. Um, yeah, sorry. Right. Because it doesn't have its own. Uh, Amida, you're absolutely right. Then you have That's Shacharit. The it's true. Then Shacharit. Then Musaf. Right? And then we have Mincha and Ne'ila. That's five. Mariv, Shacharit, Musaf, Mincha, Ne'ila. Those are your five services you do. And they also reflect, uh, reflect the five Inuyim, the five um, physical pains we take on. And the five levels of the soul, each one comes to correct a different level of the soul as well, the rabbis tell us. Okay? So, neat last, so that's three. So, that's four. Four. so, do it again. Kol Nidre comes together with Arvit, Shacharit is two, Musaf, three, Mincha, four, Nila is five. What are the five, the soul? What do you say? Five, five levels of the soul. There are five levels of the soul. Does everyone know the five levels of the soul? Yeah. No. Okay, let's do that then. Let's do that, shall we? What are the five levels of the soul? Okay, go for it. The highest one I think is the Chaya, right? Let's start with the lowest one. Okay. Nefesh. Right? Nefesh is the lowest level. Then? Neshama. No. Ruah. Yes. Nefesh is the first? Nefesh is the lowest level. So which one Right, this is called the Nefesh Bahamit. This is actually level five, really, I guess. So would that be the equivalent of Ni'ila? Oh, I, oh, I don't. How it fits in? Oh, that I don't know. Oh, that I thought that's what you were doing. Okay. No, no, no. It that's probably is. Today. Then ruach. That's the middle level. The nefesh. The nefesh is found in the in the um, blood. Ki adami, and that's why you're not allowed to drink animal blood because you're taking in the nefesh of the animal. So that's why we don't drink animal blood. We share that. That's the level of the soul that deals all the physical nefesh bahamit. Then you have the ruach, which is located in the. Heart is correct. Because you speak from your heart. I literally have the definition of Right, ruach is the spirit. It actually means wind, but it comes to speech, right? We're going to be speaking being. Nefesh ruach. Then we have neshama, which is the go-to term for all five, but it's actually the middle level. Probably the most important because it's located in the moach, the brain. Nefesh, ruach, neshama. Hmm? The five levels of the soul. I'm, I keep referring to it. Might as well know what they are. And the, the two are which are beyond us. 
These always go together. These three go together. In Kabbalah, they say Naran. Who is referring to Naran? It's referring to these levels. The Nefesh, Ruch, and Kabbalah. This is um, action, speech, thought. But then we don't reach the other action, speech, thought. Action is the blood? Action is the blood, right? Because it's always moving around. Yeah. Becca, we're going to fill in that missing chief education. Whether it kills me, we're going to get this for you, my girl. Action, speech, thought. Good? Nefesh, Ruch, Neshama. Then the two higher levels that we don't know too much about, unless you study, you know, Kabbalah, are the Chaya and Yechida, which is the highest levels. They're not located in the body. They're located in Shemayim, and they're connected, says the Ariz, says the Ramchal, via a Shalshalat, a chain. A bracelet, necklace. Well, it means a chain, a Shalshalat. A chain. Why, why don't they use one of those ones? Explain. So it's Chaya and Yechida. So those are the high levels of the soul which are not located in the body, okay? But they're all connected via a chain, a shell shell it. So if you pull on one, it kind of relates to the others. Becca. Wait, so that's two or one? So those are two. Chaya and the highest level is Yechida. Again, these are, the, these are levels of the soul which are not located in the body, as it were. They're in Shemayim. But they're connected to the lower levels. I wasn't planning on doing this today, but it's good, it's good important information. You've got to know this. Shal Shalet. Shal Shalet. It means a chain. It literally means a chain. Tough. It means a chain because he says that just like a person, you're, you're in the Mashiach class, we do this in more detail. But when a person does the, the lowest level, can pull a person away. And when a person does a, a Vera that gives you karet, they're actually cutting off these two levels, they say. Karet? Karet. Is that what some say? Karet. No, you don't get karet for that. You get skila for that. What's karet, that? you get uh, like for eating, eating on, possibly. I thought that's what it was. It can be. Some disagree with that. It, it means spiritual cut off. It means cut off from those two levels of your neshama. But you can do teshuva for them, by the way. Um, eating food in Yom Kippur is karet. No way. Loleinu. Um, eating chametz on Pesach, having sexual relations with a nida is karet as well. All these are karetable. When the woman is menstruant. Cut off well, not forever. The word karet means cut off because you could do tshuva and bring it back. But there's a certain disconnect. So those are the five levels of the soul. Are we good on that? Um, well, that's a very good question. Just death itself is a kapara. When the soul leaves the body at death, it is machaper, a person's neshama a little bit as well. Yeah. I, so I'm not saying that's what the rabbis tell us. That's very clearly written in many places. Yeah. Question. The three things you mentioned, those were, what are they called in Hebrew? They are, well, well, they refer to, the, the rabbis refer to it by naran, nun resh nun. Right? It's nefesh ruach. If you see that word naran, it's referring to this. These three levels of the soul. Naran. No, no, no. So if a person does an, uh, uh, one of the bad Averot, they are, connect, they are disconnected from these two levels of the soul. Okay. Wait, isn't there another... But Yom Kippur fixes that. Old Shuba fixes that. Isn't there another section of Davening where you leave because people... Yes, sir. Yes, yes, uh, yeah, what about no, that's it? part of... Uh, no. Yeah, you always do a shul years ago. No, 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 like a lot of people for after October. Oh, okay, okay. They said that everyone, a lot of shuls did it. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. most people did add a, uh, an element of that. I was thrown off when we started doing a baby monkey. Why? Because it was Shabbat. Oh, at the end you do it, yeah. And I, at the end. At the end. And I, no, but no, not at the end of... But I'm saying, like, for Friday night, all of a sudden, we're doing a Bina Malkinu. Like, they ended up in, or whatever, at one point, they did a Bina Malkinu, and I was... Why? Because of the situation? And it turns out they've been, they, they, I, I, I later heard They've been rap, doing I it right through the year. They've done it all throughout all the year. All the year. But I didn't know that people were Okay, that. one last piece. Page 40, the mitzvah itself. So we're going to continue this next class. But the mitzvah itself is vidui. Vidui. Vidui is actually the mitzvah of the Shuvah and Yom Kippur. So what do you actually what what actually makes Yom Kippur Yom Kippur? You're fasting, but all of that is that to help you do what? Teshuvah. What is Teshuvah? Vidui. 
vidui is actually the mitzvah, says the Rambam, of teshuvah. Right? Vidui is the actual mitzvah itself, means to confess your sins. That's it. Now, for us, it's a standard text in the, uh, in the uh, Yom Kippur Machzor. But it's really, uh, it's really coming from you. Which people don't know how to do it nowadays, so they just wrote it all down. But for a long time, basically, you mention, it's three parts to it, in short. It's past, present, future. Okay? And this is how to do Teshuvah, because Teshuvah is Vidui. Past is, I regret what I did. Yep. Three parts. I regret... It's called having charata. Charata is I regret. I moda, I admit. Right now I admit it. And the last part is the future. Azivat achet won't do it again. Even if you know you're going to do it again. Because everyone does it. Very good question. So what do we say? How do we say on Rosh Hashanah? Basher Husham, you're judged as you feel and as you act at that moment. You're judged in that window, and you mean it. Now, there isn't a single person who lives in this world who doesn't sin. Everyone sins. So you're not going to sin again. So I'm lying then. No, because at that time, I mean it, and I am committed to improving myself, and therefore it works. Uh-huh. I'm still- right. Even though I know that I'm doing it again, yeah. yeah and, and certain Nusach, they do say that. That is correct. Even so, I'm still doing Teshuvah for what I did. Okay? But that's actually the three parts of it. And now it's a text. So let's look at the Rambam on page 40, and then we'll talk about the big Kohanim and the Ilah next class. Kol varim, one who confesses with words, but is not committed in their heart to lazov, to leave, it's like a person going to, into a mikvah holding on to a sheretz, a, um, a contaminated creature, right? It's not, it's not going to help. You have to, when you say it, you have to mean it. You have to mean it, and you have to be committed to try not to do that thing again. Now, we're not perfect, and you're going to speak Lashon again, but I'm working on my point saying it's not right what I did, and I want to work on that aspect again, Okay. And one who, and that's where he finishes off by saying, one who acknowledges and leaves his sin will be treated mercifully. So you're judged at that moment at that time, I regret it, and I'm going to do my best not to do it again. Okay? That is actually the mitzvah of the day itself. Okay, we'll stop over there. Thursday, we're going to continue Yom Kippur, and then we're going to review for our midterm, which will be next Thursday. You're welcome. <laughs>